Uh, let's move on to injecting dependencies. This is a really good one, and for what it's worth, it seems to come up a lot in interviews, um, have the, so my former students have said. So take that with a, a grain of salt. Um, sometimes you will hear this called dependency inversion, or as opposed to dependency injection, but they refer to the same thing. Um, and as I said when we started uh, talking about solid in the previous lecture, officially, uh, dependency injection is the D in solid, and the I stands for another principle that we won't talk about, which is interface segregation. Um, but either way, whether it starts with I or D, whether it's injection of dependencies or dependency inversion, it's all the same thing. And the problem it's trying to solve is you have a scenario where you've got two components. One depends on the other uh, in terms of the, the way that it expects to call it. But not only the implementation, but maybe even the interface of component B can change. So again, let's, if we do it backwards from an example, uh, suppose that I have uh, something that I want to be able to um, use as a session store, session storage like cookies or something like that. Um, I have a database, and the functionality is clear. I want to be able to sometimes store a session in the database and maybe retrieve it later, so the, the way that, uh, for example, cookies work in the frameworks that we've seen. But the problem here is, what if you decide that databases shouldn't be the only way to store sessions? Maybe you have a way to store them in something that doesn't look like a database. Maybe it's a cache, or maybe it's a file system. So the idea of storing and retrieving the session has not changed, but the kinds of calls have changed quite dramatically because the type of thing you're going to use for session storage may change out from under you. Uh, so the reason it's called dependency objection is that uh, counterintuitively, the way you fix it is by creating a new dependency that doesn't already exist. Um, and it ends up looking like this. You say, well, uh, we're not going to ever have session store directly call database. We're going to create this intermediary thing, which is really just an interface. All it does is provide a common, uh, well-known set of calls to whoever the caller is above it, and it will translate those into whatever it looks like for uh, the thing below it. Um, sometimes, but not always, the thing below it is implemented as true inheritance, but I'll, I'll show an example where that doesn't need to be the case. Um, and there's a few different variations of this pattern, but basically all you're really doing is you're inserting a layer here that essentially hides not only the implementation, but even the interface of the thing under it. So now, if we replace database with file system, uh, a file system is not going to have calls like read from database or store in database, but that's okay because session manager no longer cares about that. It just knows that the session store interface provides generic get session and store session or something like that, right? Um, if the, if the match between the underlying interface and the one that you're injecting is almost one-to-one, -one, uh, sometimes people call that an adapter or a facade, but the important concept is you are deliberately inserting this layer of indirection, and we all know that's how you solve problems in computer science, right? You, you insert a level of indirection somewhere. This level of indirection's job is to keep the interface stable looking up the stack. So session manager never has to worry about it. Um, in terms of the way this is done in Ruby, very often, this middle thing will be a module, because a module is a great place to put a namespace. But that's a secondary consideration. The, the architecture here of, instead of having session store depend on the interface of a database, we create a new generic interface that hides everything about the interface below it. That's actually the important bit. Um, and you've actually seen a couple of examples of this in action, um, because Active Record sort of already does this. Uh, so I'm going to show you, let's see which, ex which two examples do I have queued up. Um, the f actually, so the first example is active record itself. So the, if you look at the source code for how active record is organized as part of Ruby, think about the issues that it has to deal with. Uh, the whole point of active record is looking up, right, for the models that use active record or subclass from it, um, it wants to provide a consistent set of abstractions for what it means to talk to a database. But it turns out that even if you're looking only at relational databases like MySQL, Oracle, Postgres, SQLite, the specifics of how the interface is exposed to a client are quite different among those. Right? They, they all support the same kinds of operations, but the interface signatures are quite different. So if you look at the source code for Active Record, this is how it's actually organized. Um, Active Record Base has a method called connection. Um, you never use that method directly, but all of the code in Active Record that talks to the database does use it. But that method is really just an interface to something called an abstract adapter. The abstract adapter provides a common 
set of database like operations with a common set of names that Active Record Base can rely on. So there, you can establish a connection, you can ask if the connection is free, you can try to send a query over the connection, there are various things like that, even though, depending on the specific type of database, the way those operations have to be done against that database are very different. So again, what's happened here is instead of having Active Record Base essentially try to talk directly to one or another kind of database, right, which doesn't work because even the names of these methods are going to be very different across different databases, a dependency has been injected so that the only thing Active Record Base relies on is what are the method calls available through Abstract Adapter. Abstract Adapter's job is to map each one of those possible method calls to the right thing for some other database, which means each database has to have an adapter that is able to take its operations that it can provide and somehow make them look like something that Abstract Adapter can map to. Right? So by doing that, we have completely isolated not only the implementation of the database from Active Record, but even the interface to the database. Right? That's the problem that dependency injection solves. Sir? Uh, just drawing analogies like my own project is master. Yeah. There's a proxy file that is there between the model as, and the Oracle server. So is that similar to what happens here? Uh, what did you call it? A, pr a proxy file. So Prox uh, I, f I think we may actually be about to do an example. There's actually a variation of this called the proxy pattern, and if you give me a few minutes to get to it, um, and if I have not by then answered your question, can you remind me and we'll come back to it? Okay, coolio. Um, so again, what are the mechanisms being used here? Delegation. This connection method in Active Record Base doesn't actually do anything. It just forwards the call to the appropriate method in Abstract Adapter. Overriding, so the connection method in Abstract Adapter has to eventually look like something that each of the individual database adapters can do, and these are usually, oops, uh, and these are usually implemented by inheritance. They don't have to be, but they usually are. For what it's worth, um, if it turned out that inheritance wasn't a reasonable mechanism here, we could pull the same trick. We could say Abstract Adapter just has an instance of MySQL adapter as one of its components, and it will selectively delegate calls to it, maybe mixed in with some other code. Okay, but again, what's the key thing? This injected dependency, right? It, it got put between the two things that otherwise would have been dependent on each other. That's why it's an injected dependency. And it isolates giving a stable interface looking at its caller and making sure that all of the callees can somehow be mapped into that interface. Um, I'll give you another real life example. Um, and this one has to do with supporting external services. Uh, so I have uh, an app in which I use external services for email marketing. If you've ever heard of MailChimp or Constant Contact, these are services that let you send large volumes of email to targeted groups of people. Um, and for various reasons, you should never try to do that in your app. You should rely on a reliable external service to do this. Uh, so both of those services have nice RESTful APIs. They are designed to be integrated into other software as a service. And both of them generally do the same kinds of things. They let you have different lists of customers. They let you sort of uh, schedule an email for sending, detect whether a particular customer has opted out, all of that other stuff. But the interfaces they present, right, their RESTful APIs for how you do those things are quite different from each other. So I had to pull the same trick. Um, my customer model has, as one of its components, a thing called an email list. And the email list is actually kind of like the abstract adapter. The only thing it presents are the methods that its caller would ever care about. So as a, from the point of view of maintaining a customer model and asking if that customer should be on the email list or not, the only thing this model cares about is opt in the customer, opt out the customer, and maybe update the customer's email address if they, if they change their email address on the marketing service. So all these other services do a whole bunch of other stuff, but the, from my point of view in my app, my caller is never going to care about that other stuff. That's all it cares about. So the job here is provide a stable interface so that it's always safe to call these. And just like in the example above, I also have a class that wraps the actual RESTful API for MailChimp. Um, it happens to have API calls that have names like subscribe, unsubscribe, update member. So in this case, the mapping is actually pretty close, but I don't have to worry about that anymore, right? I've isolated the specifics of this interface from the caller by injecting the abstract email list in between. And in the future, I have been asked by one of my customers, uh, they don't use MailChimp, they use Constant Contact, which is a competing service. Um, I actually don't know what the Constant Contact API is. I just know that they have one. And I'm sure that somehow, in terms of that API, I can get these things to happen. But once I figure this out, 
uh, the customer model won't care because all of its API calls are basically through this injected dependency. Right? So this is a really, really cool mechanism. Um, in this case, some people call this uh, the facade pattern um, because in this example, even though the actual things that we're calling, that, that leaf of the tree, um, it has all of these other APIs for other things, but in our use case, the only set of things we cared about is this small set of stuff. So it's not just that it's sort of providing an adapter to mask the differences f between the interfaces, it's actually providing a much simpler version because we only care about using a subset of stuff. So not that it's like a, a, you know, the terminology is not super, super critical, but if you care and people say, oh, we had to create a facade adapter over something, what they usually mean is that the facade may take a subset of the underlying API, or it may unify distinct underlying APIs into a single one. So for example, if you read the, the documentation for the MailChimp REST API, these six things are actually six different RESTful APIs with six slightly different endpoints. Uh, but again, all we care about is, can we do these three things? From our point of view, this is a single set of related API calls, and that's all that the application ever sees. So that's dependency injection, and don't be surprised if this comes up uh, on a uh, interview-related question. I will get to the proxy pattern. Uh, I want to talk about other adapter-like patterns because somebody brought, an, brought up an example of one, and I think um, it's probably going to be covered uh, in this discussion. So in general, an adapter-like pattern is one that follows the general approach that we just saw, which is for whatever reason, you have one interface and you want to adapt it uh, by, putting some, you know, by putting some sort of a layer on top of it. Maybe it's because you want to shield the caller from changes. Maybe it's because you want to simplify the caller's view of that interface. Uh, so the, uh, the, the dependency injection uh, that we just saw using the adapter and the facade is one example of this. Here's a couple of others that come up pretty often. Um, my favorite of the others is probably the null object pattern. Um, and the idea behind the null object pattern is that uh, it, your design is simpler if there are some invariant things that are true, uh, that are always true about a certain object and all subclasses of that object. But there's something about the implementation uh, or the requirements of your app that makes it hard to do that. So uh, again, I'm going to use an example from my own experience from real life, um, which is uh, all over, sprinkled all over one of my applications is the idea that there's a bunch of properties you can ask about a customer. Um, the problem is that in some places, those calls are made in a scenario where nobody has logged in yet. So if, the, if someone has logged in, then the customer object refers to a real instance of the class that supports all these methods, like logged in, last name, is a VIP. But if nobody is logged in, then there isn't any object on which you can call these methods. The naive way to fix that is any place that you would be about to call a method, you would first check whether at customer has a non-nil value or whether it actually has a value that uh, is an instance of the class. A way more elegant way to do it is to basically create something that is called a singleton class. Um, and there's a technique in, in Ruby for doing this where you have a class that only has one instance of itself. And within that one instance, you basically selectively override the behaviors. You could also, by the way, do this with subclassing, um, where you can create a special class called the null customer class, which is a subclass of customer, but it overrides all of the basic methods on customer to do something harmless. So if you ask the null customer if they're logged in, it's always false. If you ask the null customer what is its last name, it's always anonymous, and so on. The idea is that you no longer have to worry whether it is A, legal to do these calls, because the thing you're doing them on is a fully fledged uh, instance of a subclass of customer, and B, you don't have to worry that the calls return something unsafe. Right? So uh, you know that, for example, last name will never, for example, return nil. It'll always return a string. Therefore, you don't have to do anything different or special if you're using it on the null customer. Null object is a great pattern for stuff like this. And in fact, one of the places I'm refactoring to use it is in this uh, same email marketing list example that I started with before. Uh, some of my customers do not use any external marketing service. So in that case, it would be nice, whoo, I almost fell off. It would be nice if they didn't have to worry about that fact. I can just create a special class called fake email list, which is a, you know, it's a subclass of email list, just like all the other ones are. Um, I can use true inheritance because I really do want to provide these exact method calls, but I will just override all of them. 
if you uh, tell the email list to opt a customer in, it will silently do nothing. Um, if you ask the customer to opt out, it will silently do nothing. If you ask it a question like, how many people are on your fake email list, it will always say zero. So it does something that is sensible. It behaves in all respects like a real email list, but it's, it's effectively been stubbed out the hard way. So that's the null object pattern. Um, and when I, when I said one, one, bleh, one implementation of that involves using a singleton class, um, a singleton class is technically a class of which only one instance of that class is ever allowed to exist. So this is one way to implement the null object pattern is that you create a singleton class that, um, well, let me see if I have, yes, I do have a, an example. One way I can do this is uh, within my, my regular old customer class, I can declare a class method that will do this, in, this little bit of uh, Ruby incantation, which is uh, I'm going to add to the set of all known classes a thing that is an instance of a customer. So again, don't worry too much about the syntax. I just want to give you the flavor of one way to do this uh, in a language that supports it particularly elegantly. I'm essentially creating a brand new class but the only contents of that class are this single instance of it. And now that I have that single instance of it, I'm just going to override all of the methods in my regular class, and I'm going to do them to do something that the null customer would do. Um, the, only, the only refused bequest I'm going to have is this one, that if I try to assign a new name in my example, I'm raising an error. Um, I could also have just sort of silently done nothing. Um, but again, the idea is that this is, uh, some, some languages actually have a specific me mechanism for doing singleton classes. This is sort of an elegant way to do it in Ruby. Do not worry too much if the syntax looks a little bit weird, but what is the concept of a singleton class? There's one instance of it ever, and in that instance, one of the, one of the things you can do with that instance is you can use it to implement the null object pattern. Um, the other related one, and I believe this is one that somebody brought up, uh, is the idea of a proxy object. And the concept of a proxy is that it behaves the same way, it implements the same methods as some real object but for some specific reason, it does something different than the real object would do. Um, so I suppose you could argue that uh, the null object pattern is actually a specialized case of the proxy, where what the proxy object is doing is sort of nothing. Um, but in practice, proxy objects are usually used for more sophisticated things. Uh, so for example, you can imagine a proxy object, uh, one of the ones that you've already seen, is when you do these collection associations. Um, if a movie has many reviews and you say movie.reviews, um, it may not have occurred to you to ask the question, what kind of a thing is returned by movie.reviews? And what we've been saying is only half true. We've been saying that it returns an enumerable collection. But that's actually not what it returns. What it really returns is an object that if you ever ask it to enumerate itself, it can do so. And in fact, it won't do so until the moment you ask. So the actual database query associated with this doesn't happen until you start to, to, to until you try to start pulling out results. However, for all practical purposes, this behaves like an enumerable connect collection. You can ask it to enumerate itself. You can dereference a specific element. So it is a proxy object in that it behaves just like the thing that it looks like, an, an enumerable collection. But the way those behaviors are implemented is dramatically different from if it were a real enumerable collection. Um, Another example of this is uh, if you have an application, for example, that deals with things like email sending. Normally, the thing to which you would you know, send an outgoing email is something, some object that is intended to model an email server. But if you're disconnected from the internet, one thing you could do is have a proxy object that has the same behavior, so it can accept a message for delivery with the understanding that the actual delivery won't occur until much later when the app gets reconnected to the internet. But from the point of view of whoever calls it, it's the same idea. Right? It's an object that, just like a real server, it has a method that means uh, send this email. Um, you can do the same thing with printers. Right? You can have a, uh, if you think of the save as PDF option when you're printing something, that is an example of a proxy object that does all the things a printer does, but the way it implements them is it saves them to a PDF file instead of actually sending the content to a printer to, to be printed. So that's the, uh, that's the basic idea of the proxy pattern. And I, I don't know if that does or doesn't address the, the use case that you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, what is the point of the null object pattern? When would you use the null object pattern? T typically, so the, the most common case is uh, there's a kind of object that is used all over the place in your app, but there are some cases where the object in question, the instance that you have, doesn't correspond to a real instance. Um, so the example I gave was. Uh, 
Most of the time, there's a user logged into the app, and the, model, the object that captures the concept of a user can just be that user. So anything that is safe to do to a user, you could do to that object. But what do you do if you've got code in your app that might be executed when someone's logged in, or it might be executed when nobody is logged in? You could have two versions of that code, but that's sloppy. You could have one version of that code that checks if somebody's logged in and then does two different things. Or you could always have someone be logged in, but when there's nobody really logged in, the logged in person is this user that has these fixed properties, and it's always just safe to pass them around. So that's the most common scenario, is there are some situations in the app where the object might not look like a normal version of that object, and you don't want to have to have special case checks just to check that condition in every such place. That's the classic null object usage. Yeah? Uh, so can I give an example of, of work being deferred? So in the movie.reviews case, work is being deferred. Yeah, I mean, but like, in, like in this example? Um, well, in this example, it's not clear that work is being deferred because the, the idea of deferment would probably happen inside of do something. Right, so d I mean, d deferring just means, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with class design, it just means um, pretend to agree to do something now that in fact won't happen until later. Uh, so a, a more realistic example of defer would be like printing, right? Actually, when you print, it's not the case that you are talking to the actual guts of the printer. You're talking to an object that is basically pretending to be a printer and saying, okay, I've printed it. But as you know, what that really means is I have queued it and it'll be printed soon enough um, unless the printer crashes in between and then the proxy object is no longer a perfect proxy. So I'm just using deferred work as an example of a use case where a proxy object might be useful. Um, you know, you, you, if, if you can't talk to the printer, you can provide a stand-in that claims to have talked to the printer, but it, it won't actually do it till later. Right. But there's nothing about um, the class diagram here that specifically implies doing deferred work. The class diagram is just meant to say that the, the service proxy thing, as opposed to the real service thing, have exactly the same interface. They, they can be safely substituted one for the other um, for the actual service. That's all the, uh, the diagram is meant to say. A couple more of these. Um, the, and by the way, I, I recognize that um, it's a little daunting to try to have to you know, be told about all these different design patterns. And you know, now I'm like, OK, be on the lookout for when you can use you know, the proxy pattern, and you, know, you better use it. Nobody learns to use design patterns that way. Um, and that's the reason that whenever possible, we've tried to present it as, here's a real use case that if you didn't use the pattern, your code would be messy. Um, and sometimes you're going to find that you just finished writing code, and now you look at it, and you're like, that looks kind of ugly. And it, it, it's not clear why it doesn't smell right, but it doesn't. That is how you learn to use design patterns. It's by writing code that is initially kind of bad, and then afterward coming to the realization that, oh, if I had thought about doing it this way, I could have done it better. And that's fine, because the next time you do that type of code, it'll come to you, and you're like, ah, OK, this, I'll just solve this using the proxy pattern, and you'll be golden. So don't feel bad if. This feels like, how am I ever going to know when to use these? Everybody goes through the same things. That said, a couple of other useful patterns to know. Um, the idea of the composite pattern uh, is when you have a certain type of model where operations on a collection often make sense as the same corresponding operations on a member of the collection, or on the aggregate, if you want to call it, instead of a collection. So uh, again, I'll give an example inspired by, although not currently implemented. Well, it's sort of implemented by uh, an app that I maintain. Um, I have uh, different kinds of tickets that I distinguish. Uh, let's, for, the sim you know, for a simplified version of the argument, we'll call, we'll call them regular tickets, VIP tickets, and subscriptions. Um, and all three things have in common that you can buy them. So they, you know, they have a price. Um, and because you can buy them, they are a thing that can be added like to a shopping cart. However, uh, regular and VIP tickets are for a particular kind of show, or you know, usually for a particular date. Um, a subscription is actually a placeholder for like five other things. So when you buy a subscription, what you actually are getting is one ticket to each of five or however many other shows. Um, but a subscription still has a price, and it still can be added to an order. So essentially, the, the way that you model something like this is there's uh, whatever the base component is, the behaviors that don't change go here. So you might even think of this as an interface in some cases. Um, so the base class is what are the things that are the same whether you're doing it to an individual item or to an aggregate of those items, right? So that it has a price, that it can add itself to an order, those things are in common. Um, 
then you have the individual object, um, and it may be that you know, the, the collection consists of multiple instances of these. Um, there may be some operations on the individual objects that do not make sense on the component. So there may be additional methods here that are not methods up here. By the way, why is that not a problem with Liskov substitution? <coughs> if I'm saying that, uh, that these subclasses, right, and I'm using the open arrow, so I really mean inheritance here, why is it not a Liskov problem if I have additional methods here that do not appear in the superclass? You can take my word for it, by the way, that it really is not a problem. Yeah? Right, exactly right. So if I had methods in the superclass that the subclasses couldn't handle, that's the problem with Liskov substitution, right? Liskov just says anywhere that, a com that this component is legal to pass, then either of these subclasses should also be legal. And that's fine, because if it thinks it's getting a component, it's not going to occur to the caller to try to do these specialized operations because they aren't part of component. So there's no Liskov problem in subclasses that extend the behavior of the superclass. That is totally cool. Uh, so we have the individual object, which may have some behaviors that don't make sense for the component or that are, are not common to both. And then you have the collection, which is also called the composite, um, and it has methods that only make sense on the collection. So for example, um, asking the composite item how many of something it has makes sense at this level, but it does not make sense up here because the superclass is supposed to be capturing only the common ones. In code, here is a way that it might look. Um, I could have a base class uh, of ticket that has things like price and add to order. That's what the behaviors are that whether it's an individual uh, instance or an aggregate of them, either of those things make sense. Um, regular tickets have the idea of being uh, part of uh, or associated with a particular date. So that's something that would go only in the item model. Um, same thing with a VIP ticket. And then a subscription or multi-ticket or whatever we want to call it um, has other methods like which tickets are included in you, or add other tickets so that there are more tickets included in you. Those are things that don't make sense except on the collection. Um, and that's kind of the key for the composite pattern, right? You're separating out things that make sense for both the individual item and the collection, and then you've got things that only make sense on individual items, things that maybe only make sense on collections. Um, you can actually subclass both of them directly. Uh, you can see that there's a few differences, like, you know, they, uh, and then when you implement some of these methods, you know, for like for a multi-ticket, what does it mean to um, add a multi-ticket to your order? Well, in the multi-ticket class, we will override the common add to order method, um, and we'll basically call the superclass method on each individual instance, right? So we still have an add to order method; it still has the same interface. Liskov substitutability is being preserved, but we're overriding the implementation of these methods because the behavior of price or the behavior of adding itself to an order is going to be different for the multi-ticket than it is for any instance. So it is still true inheritance, right? We're reusing some behaviors, we're overriding some behaviors, but it is always safe to provide one of these wherever that would have been called because we can, we can sanely implement all of the methods of the superclass even if we have to override a couple of them. So that's a pretty standard example. Um, if you end up using something like this, there is actually a mechanism called single table inheritance that lets you put all the subclasses of the model into the same table, which is pretty interesting because the discussion from the previous example suggests that the, the subclasses may have attributes that are not shared by the parent class, um, which means that depending on whether a particular row of that model table is an instance of the base class or one of the subclasses, which attributes are dereferenceable may actually make a difference. Um, and that's why it's nice that Rails actually has some machinery that manages this for you. Uh, basically, if you, have a, uh, if you add a, a column called type, um, that column is assumed to be the name of the subclass of the appropriate object, and Rails does all the right things. So if you happen to pull out something from the database whose type column was set to regular ticket, even if the base model, the ticket or the, uh, the table is called the tickets table, when you pull out something whose type column is set to this, Ruby will cast it to the correct type. So what you will get back is an instance of either the base class or the correct subclass, depending on what the type column says. Okay, so it's a, a, you know, use the mechanism with care, but it's a mechanism that is there specifically to help uh, with design patterns like the composite pattern, which I think is pretty cool.